Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. I will now turn the conference over to Robin Thompson. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good afternoon or morning, everyone, depending on which coast you're on. We'd like to welcome you to the June Knowledge Leadership Webinar. The team at BIA is so happy that you're spending your time with us today. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before I turn the program over to our distinguished panel. If you have questions for the speakers today, please submit those through the chat window, and our moderator, Barry Schwartz, will present those to the panel at the end of the program. And second, as you exit today, you'll be asked to answer a brief survey. We take your valuable feedback to plan our curriculum going forward in our Knowledge Leadership Series. Today we're going to be talking about medical grade e-discovery, ESI, and life sciences mass torts. My challenge and privilege today is to find a way to briefly introduce such a distinguished panel whose accomplishments would take the hour to share with you. I will do my best and I invite you to read more about them on our slides here and on their bio pages of the Bowman and Brook website. Our panel today will be moderated by Barry Schwartz, a licensed attorney who after a distinguished career in the medical device industry and corporate sector and after practicing law, joined BIA as VP of Advisory Services. Our guest panel today are three partners and trial attorneys with the nationally recognized and honored firm of Bowman and Brook. Mary Novacek is a partner in the Minneapolis office and leads the discovery coordination and e-discovery practice for Bowman and Brook. In addition to being a highly accomplished trial attorney, Mary is a member of the Sedona ESI Working Groups and is a recognized speaker and author. Mike Hurwitz is a partner in the San Diego office and serves as national counsel for drug and medical device manufacturers. Mike has a distinguished and honored career as an attorney and is a graduate of IADC Trial Academy. Finally, we're joined by Greg Jackson, also a partner in the San Diego office of Bowman and Brook and also a distinguished and honored trial attorney. Greg is national counsel for all product liability matters for a global medical device company and is also a graduate of the IADC Trial Academy. And with that, Barry, I turn the program over to you. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, Mike will start us off with a discussion of some of the first steps that you should undertake when confronted with mass tort litigation. Mike? Good morning, everyone. Uh, our topic today is e-discovery and life science mass torts. Uh, the first question is, why is e-discovery important? And it's probably a question that everyone knows the answer to. Um, we're going to take you through not only why is it important in terms of culling through the documents and finding the relevant information, but how the plaintiff's attorneys use it and why is it important to them. Uh, the decisions you make early in your litigation will impact you for the rest of the life of the mass tort. So decisions that you make before the, tort, the lawsuits are even filed are things that you're going to have to live with. So you need to make sure at the beginning that you're making smart decisions because you're, excuse me, you're going to have to live with them. The choices you make are probably not going to win you the case, but I think as we've all seen, they can certainly lose you the case. And they can drive up premiums for settlement amounts uh, vastly. <clears throat> um, the question is, why is e-discovery important in a mass tort? Well, first you need to take a step back and, and look at a typical mass tort. Well, typical mass torts are typically are filled with claimants whose claims are not worth filing as individual lawsuits. Most of the plaintiffs learned of the litigation from watching a TV or Internet ad and responded to a 1-800 number. Many or most of the plaintiffs have huge problems with product identification, causation, or damages. The plaintiffs' attorneys in mass torts want to take the focus off of their weak plaintiffs or their weak individual claims and turn the focus onto what a bad actor the corporate defendant is or what 
that information is in the corporate defendant's documents. One of the best ways that the plaintiff's attorneys have found is through e-discovery. They can find emails, draft versions of documents that can be used to paint the defendant in a bad light. I think we've probably all seen examples of, of how this is done. Uh, not only are they able to find bad information, but through ESI they are able to increase the cost of defending the lawsuits exponentially. Uh, studies show that review of e-discovery can cost upwards of $30,000 per gigabyte of data. And to put that into context, a gigabyte of data can contain somewhere between 10 and 75,000 pages of content. Um, companies have multiple gigabytes that are typically uh, searched so that you know, the cost can be six or seven figures. Uh, the plaintiff's attorneys know that many of the insurance policies are er eroded by defense costs. The higher the cost of the litigation for the defendant, the more likely that that defendant will be motivated to settle the cases to avoid those costs. Another reason that plaintiff's lawyers request e-discovery is that it gives them ammunition for discovery motions and sanctions. Anytime a plaintiff can get in front of a judge and claim that the defendant is holding docu hiding documents, it's a good thing for them. It impacts the credibility of not only the defendant, but the, de the defense lawyers in front of the judge. Uh, the plaintiff's lawyers can also seek monetary and evidentiary sanctions, and those issues, including the evidentiary sanctions, may be heard in front of the jury. Uh, it's obviously terrible for the defendant to have allegations that they were hiding or destroying documents in front of a jury. Mary? Well, uh, Michael, let me interject one thing here. Um, in terms of early case preparation, when you're confronted with mass torts, and that is that we recommend to our clients that as um, a, a matter is being undertaken and data is required to be collected, that we try to collect all user-created data from, from various custodians at the outset so as to not have to touch them again. And more importantly, because as these cases extend over the years, search criteria change, keywords change, relevant date uh, restrictions and cutoffs change, and by collecting all that data up front is one method of controlling costs because collections themselves are, are one of the lowest costs aspects of e-discovery. And I just wanted to put that point on the table. Uh, Mary? And that is, yes, that is a very good point, Barry, that the collections need to be early, not only to save costs, you're absolutely correct on that, but also from a litigator perspective, I am preparing for the eventual motions to compel that I know will be coming. And if I can stand up in court and raise my hand and tell the judge, that we were there at the outset and we did a very broad and reasonable collection, it will earn me a lot of credibility with the court about how seriously we are taking the client's ESI obligations. And as Mike mentioned, you know, your, while your first case tends to set the scope, for a mass tort, you will have many events occur as a company over the lifetime of that mass tort. Your company may move. You will have key employees who depart over time. And you'll have employees who your company will go through normal hardware updates and changes. All of those things affect your preservation obligations. And if you can show the court that you did a very reasonable and thorough collection at the outset, even come year five, six, seven, eight down the road, your collection dated at the outset of the litigation is going to be more compelling because it will be more timely, a time, more, more timely view of the information in those relevant custodians' uh, inboxes, on their uh, computers at the time that the litigation started. So what, let's just talk for a moment, I'm trying to switch this little slide, all right, proactively limit. What can you do to proactively limit ESI? So we're talking about collection. But looking down the road as companies, there are things that you can do to help, help me 
Keep your costs to a minimum when it comes time to do these important collections. And it starts with your records policies. My favorite records policy is a retention limit on, ES on email. And let me tell you why. It's not because I don't want relevant emails. That's not the purpose. It's because I don't want a thousand emails when really all I need is a hundred. You don't want me to review emails that your employees wrote that happen to have keywords that are involved in a keyword search and it has nothing to do with the litigation. If you have a 60 or a 90 day retention limit on your employee email boxes, a lot of those what I call garbage emails that have nothing to do with the litigation but you pay me to review will be gone. That is a very, very effective cost saving measure. And when you write those policies, don't put in there that you want to in, uh, put this in to avoid litigation costs down the road. Do not mention the word litigation when you're writing a records policy on emails. You have a legitimate business purpose for placing a retention limit on your employees' email boxes because you as a company have a right to control your information. And that is a recognized business purpose and the courts will not question that. But I advise you to not use the word litigation anywhere in a written retention, records retention policy. Similarly, um, you know, educate your employees about their personal use of their laptops. We all know that we have issues with what employees put on their laptops. And the kindest way I can say it is I've seen baseball schedules, I've seen church choir schedules, I've seen house deck plans, and I've seen some other things that we all know are on there and we don't want that, want there. But when your employees are relevant custodians in litigation, they can't delete any of that stuff. I need to come in and I need to preserve their hard drive. There are sensitive things on employee hard drives, which if you teach them, do you want to paint a target on yourself? Get that stuff off your computer. Teach them because they don't want to be in that hot seat in a deposition and they don't want to have me sitting there trying to help them explain some of these things. <clears throat> Same thing with backup tapes and backup data. You know, there have been so many changes with what we as companies do to back up our data over the last 10 years. But I can tell you that some companies still use backup tape data and they don't have a written records retention policy, so their IT group just keeps sending them off site. They're over an Iron Mountain. So you may have 10 years of backup tapes. And guess what the plaintiff's attorneys will do? They will want to restore them. And there's a whole area of litigation that I've been involved in on backup tapes. But if you have a records retention policy on your backup tapes that say every three months, we're going to go through that set or every week. Whatever it is, there are many different options. Rotate, reuse. It is a legitimate business purpose to not save backup tapes. You're not saving them for archival data. You're saving them for disaster recovery. And when the next backup tape is saved, the old one is no longer useful to you. So reuse it. Have a written policy of reuse. Those three things right there are going to help you cut costs when it comes time to hiring folks like us to come in and collect data because there's naturally going to be less and it's also going to be more organized. So serial litigants need to educate your employees proactively today about the pitfalls of careless use of electronically stored information. Mike? So the next, <coughs> excuse me, the next question is, what happens when you get in your first case or, or you think you're about to have your first case? You need to conduct a reasonable search. And our point here is you don't need to overturn every single stone, but you need to make sure that you overturn the right stones. Uh, we put in here uh, that you should do a search as if your company is going to move headquarters. We've had that where a company did move headquarters and all of a the sudden they've found boxes and boxes of documents or dozens of electronic files that they had forgotten that they had. So if you conduct your search as if you're moving locations, you will uncover 
all of the information that's needed and you'll uncover it early in the first case so that you don't end up with sanctions because you didn't produce the right information in the first case but you did in the 15th case. <coughs> um, this allows you to successfully manage your ESI throughout the life of your mass tort. So one of the things that we're very cognizant of is the expense of searching for, pulling, reviewing, and producing electronically stored information. And for mass torts, a method to control this expense is to have consistent productions in all courts and cases. So if you take a step back for a moment and think about your more traditional one-off individual product liability case, you're going to want to employ a plaintiff-specific production strategy it kind of focuses on what, when the plaintiff used the product, was it a particular version or model of that product, and you want to take those factors case specific and try to limit or impose reasonable limitations on the scope of discovery. But when you're talking in the mass, in the context of a mass tort, you got to keep in mind that you're going to have hundreds, maybe thousands of plaintiffs in multiple forums. They're going to be alleging the same or similar injuries. They're going to be using different iterations of the product and having used it at different times. So when you're hit with discovery requests in a mass tort, applying a plaintiff-specific production strategy isn't practical. So instead, the most cost-effective method of handling this is to produce the same set of documents in every case. So there's a cost savings once you run your production set. You don't have to go back and redo that. But it isn't just the cost savings in the sense of legal fees and vendor fees, but it also reduces the burden on the business. There's less of a business interruption if you don't have to go back and recreate that. And when you do this consistent production, you've got to keep in mind that the battle for admissibility is going to be fought at a later stage, whether it's in motions and limine or evidentiary objections. But you have there, you, you've already gone and produced certain information, so you're going to have to fight, fight that battle at a different time in the litigation. Um, let me interject a question here. Um, how do you handle the, the straggler one-off cases within uh, mass tort litigation where you're in a different jurisdiction and the, the court or the, the plaintiff's bar is requesting different production of data? You know, Barry, this is Mary. That's a very good question. And let's talk for a moment about what a mass tort really is. A mass tort isn't an MDL. A mass tort is an MDL plus most likely a coordinated action under the JCCP in California plus other states and their various types of coordinated actions plus you'll have individual plaintiff's cases in various state and federal courts. It is a very big animal and you will have many courts involved. I have handled those one-off cases and I, I have, when, when for example, the litigation is about a product within a product line, but the basic liability issues are the same. That product works in a certain way and the labeling isn't sufficient, that's the allegation, or the user instructions should be changed or you don't have enough efficacy evidence. In general, I will produce for the entire product line in every single case. And that way I can raise my hand when I go talk to that judge and say, Your Honor, we produce the same documents in your case that we do in every other case in this litigation. And you talk to them about the work that you did to gather such that it would be covering the scope of relevant information for that case, for that product, for that plaintiff, used at that point in time with that set of instructions. You know, one, if there is one thing that I can tell you that I have learned that is the most important thing in dealing with judges in your mass tort, in the various courts, is credibility. I serve as National Discovery Council. When we get served with written discovery, I will help draft the answers. I work with local counsel, but most of the time, I like to get pro hoc, and I like to sign those answers. And when push comes to shove and we go into motions to compel or motions for protective order, I go in so I can look at the judge and say, Your Honor, I am document counsel. 
My sole objective is to assist this client in this litigation comply with your as well as all of these other courts expectations. I am a credibility source for the court about what the clients are doing and it is very important that I have that interaction with him direct him or her directly. I like to come in I say your honor we have a written format of production that we com comply with in every case that we ask every plaintiff if that is the correct format of production for them. We have ESI preservation orders in all cases. And one of the other things is when you are so consistent and you do this broad same set of production in every case is cost savings. If I only need to review and create that single set at the outset, just think of the cost savings to you, the client, where down the road you have another case with another request, you know, 75 requests for productions and 100 requests for admissions and you know, 50 interrogatories, I can produce the same set of documents and they can find the answers within them. That is a very big cost saving measure. Mike? <clears throat> so, as I was talking about earlier, the, the earliest cases set the tone for the entire litigation. Uh, in your early cases, you need to dig in and set examples. <clears throat> these, these results are going to stick with you throughout the litigation. But you need to think about when and where to set these examples. You need to pay attention to the court you're in, uh, federal versus state, or uh, California versus Florida or Pennsylvania and figure out where it is I can get those best results and strategically decide when and where you're going to dig your heels in. But it needs to be done early. Um, additionally, by setting the tone early, uh, and, and one of the themes of, of this presentation is that you're going to develop a reputation of, of e-discovery or, or discovery compliance with the court and opposing counsel. Uh, that doesn't mean you roll over and acquiesce to every single one of their demands. Uh, what it means is you dig your heels in when there's important battles to be fought. Um, and when there isn't a battle to be fought, you comply with discovery and show the judge and plaintiff's counsel that what you say you're going to produce, you actually do produce. <coughs> So following up on that thought, the, um, I have, I am guilty of looking for opportunities in some of these various courts to get orders that recognize our compliance and our hard work even when there isn't a pending motion. If I'm not in a favorable court and I'm dealing with discovery issues and we all know, yes, when you have discovery issues, it can seem like there's a rush to the end. But there is a time frame. Every court has a time frame for when it deals with motions to compel and how long you have to get your house in order before you arrive at the door of the court. Well, I am guilty of having pending motions to compel in one court and having a simple status conference in another more favorable court. And I arrive and I will talk to that judge about the same plaintiff's attorney asking a discovery request in another matter so I know it's coming to this court and I wanted to get the court's guidance on it because here's what we've done, A, B, C, D, and E, and now here's what they're asking for. I know it's coming to you, Judge. What do you think about that? And I've gotten good responses from judges. Judges love when people ask for their guidance. So I have taken transcripts from status conferences like that and used them in the courts where the motion to compel is actually pending. So I know a mass tort is not what you folks want. And I know that they can seem, they are absolutely a huge burden to the company. But if you can look through that shadow and see the benefits to mass torts, is you get several courts. 
you have an opportunity to talk to judges that you know are going to see it your way, at least more so than another judge, and strategize to find those opportunities to pave your path in a way that will help with the less favorable court. Greg? Yeah, and, and building on what Mary was saying about the advantage of litigating in multiple court forums, you know, oftentimes you'll see players will serve the same set of written discovery in various forums, and this is really an opportunity for the defendant to obtain early court orders that create limitations and try to rein in some potentially abusive discovery tactics. You know, with multiple court forums, you can look at it and try to fight your battle in the most favorable court and, and use those orders in other venues. But when you're trying to identify what's the most favorable court, well, that requires a bit of homework. You need to think about and understand the lay of the land in the various jurisdictions and venues where you're litigating and understand, obviously, you're going to want to take a look at the case law on those particular issues and what's controlling but you also have to look at your judges. And that's a case-specific inquiry because you need to figure out who would be the judge that handles the discovery motions. Are they inclined to issue favorable rulings for a corporate defendant? What is the tone of that court? So you may have a particularly friendly jurisdiction overall for a corporate defendant, but a particular judge who may not issue the type of discovery ruling that you want to take and go to the other courts and say, hey, look, Look at what's already been done. Let's apply this again. And strategically, you're going to want to look at it. What's a realistic timeline for you to get a ruling? You don't want to frame an issue for a court that's going to take three or four months to get in front of the judge because by that time, you will have already possibly dealt with it in another court that you didn't really want to be in in the first place. So you've got to look at it from that angle as well. And you know, to give you a, a kind of a example of how uh, two courts can issue completely divergent discovery rulings on the same issue and then the impact that will have. Um, there was a recent uh, verdict in Louisiana against a drug manufacturer for a little over $9 billion. Most of that was in punitive damages. In that case, the judge instructed the jury to uh, uh, consider evidence foliation against the defendant. And that's really what brought about this runaway verdict. And the issue, the discovery issue, really had to deal with an overbroad litigation hold from prior litigation that had already resolved many years in the past. Um, that litigation hold was written as such that it would essentially require that manufacturer to maintain records for long, long after the litigation was over. And the company didn't do that. Uh, apparently some documents were destroyed, not in any malicious sense from what I understand, but in, in the sense that uh, certain employees left and certain records weren't maintained. Um, that same ruling was then taken to a court in Cook County, Illinois, which is notoriously a plaintiff-friendly jurisdiction, but in that case, uh, the court said, no, we're not going to issue a sanction for the spoliation of this evidence because it didn't seem the requisite conduct or ill will to bring about such an order. And so here you have the same conduct, two different courts and completely different decisions. And the economic impact you can see from the ruling and the jury's verdict in Louisiana that it had a huge impact on the jury's tone. You know, I really like that example because you've got a mass tort, you've got a big plaintiff's verdict that comes down, and then in a completely different court you have <clears throat> the judge won't even listen to that evidence and then you get a defense verdict. Well, think of what that does to the settlement value. You've got an advantage of the fact that you had two courts instead of one for setting the tone for settlement. And we've listed some examples there for you on the screen. And these are examples of court orders that we have developed from court to court to court. And if you're deliberate and you start early and you build 
a basis of good court orders, you can control how much work your people have to do, for example. I mean, look at the first one, corporate deposition. I think that those are probably the single most disruptive business, uh, most disruptive aspect to a company's business of a mass tort litigation. You've got people that are doing their job one day, and then you have this mass tort emerge, and all of a sudden they're being deposed here, and they're deposed here, and they're deposed here. Well, we have been able to offer those folks up for deposition, certain topics, and you keep track of those topics, and then when they're noticed in the next case, you go to court and you say, Your Honor, this person was already prepped and, de and deposed on these topics. They should not be redeposed on those. And we have been able to build up favorable court orders, limiting, limiting, limiting the scope of testimony for your important corporate employees. Same thing with keyword searching. I have had experience where the, uh, keyword searching is a methodology for locating relevant evidence. That's at its simplest a definition of keyword, why you would keyword search. Well, if you don't employ that as your protocol, as your methodology for collecting relevant evidence, in the beginning of the case, you know, we're product liability lawyers. We collect complaint files. We collect warranty files. We collect design history files. We collect instructions. We co collect all of the basic stuff that the plaintiffs are going to pick on that you need to support your good defense and the plaintiffs are going to ask for in discovery early. And you companies keep those things in organized places. So I don't need to collect all of the data on your server and collect, conduct a keyword search to find the relevant documents. I just need to get in and deliberately talk to your folks about where the relevant evidence is. So keyword searching tends to be something that the other side asks two or three years down the road in a mass tort, after you've conducted your collection and produced documents, and you are able to control this by objecting to keyword searching because it is seeking stuff that would be duplicative and not relevant because you've already conducted a healthy search. So I have had really very good success with going to courts and saying, Your Honor, we collected relevant custodian emails and searched them years ago. This is, this is an additional search. We've sampled it. We've determined that it's not going to find anything new. We object to searching more than, say, 500 documents or even 2,500 documents rather than the 100,000 documents that that keyword search would retrieve because you can put a cost number on that. So we have been able to build up good orders. And once you get a good order limiting your review to 2,500 documents, you can take it to the next court and the next court. So that's, again, an advantage of having multiple court forums. Uh, I'm going to jump uh, to the Mary, last. Yeah. Uh, let me interject a question here that we sure. received from, from the audience, and that is, um, and it's a hot topic these days, is where does predictive coding technology assist review fit into mm -hmm. the scenario in, in mass tort litigation? You know, I, I am aware that a number of companies choose predictive coding as their methodology for collecting relevant evidence. I think everybody heard how I like to do it. I like to go in and say, well, where's your, where's your claim files? Where's your warranty files? Where's your drawings? Where's your design history files? And I like to collect them on a con what I call a content basis. But I do think that when you have multiple entities involved, predictive coding can be helpful when, it, when your data is what I would call disorganized. And I don't mean that in a critical way. It's just that's the way the nature of the beast. I think predictive coding can be very helpful. What I would encourage people to do, though, is to pick a protocol at the beginning of your mass tort, do it reasonably broad, whether it's predictive coding or otherwise, and then stay with that. Don't be shifting protocols. Don't be shifting methodologies because the other side asks you to. We now have enough good court orders in place say. A defendant that picks a reasonable protocol for how they're going to collect relevant evidence is the person best suited for making those choices. And if plaintiffs come along later and ask for predictive coding three years down the road, I think you have a good chance of saying, you know, that's really expensive. I've already spent a lot of money collecting my relevant documents. I don't need to do it. But I think it can be an advantage for companies with multiple subsidiaries where they have to collect relevant evidence. And I Hope that answers that question. If not, you know, send, a, send another shout back. I want to quickly touch on the very last example there. 
again, we're talking about the advantage here of multiple court forums. I have had experience with, and we all know with mass torts, it's not just product liability plaintiffs. Pretty soon you've got Department of, Department of Justice inquiries. You've got state attorneys general, sometimes Congress, sometimes other entities that are conducting, you know, the, you can have your consumer fraud claim. All of these different places, these different hits on the outside of a product that a company can take. Well, in my product liability cases, I have been able to get a successive set of court orders. You know, the first, order, re first request from the plaintiff was, give us the subpoena that the Department of Justice served on you seeking documents. Well, we objected and we went to court and we said, this subpoena served today has nothing to do with this person's use of a particular product five years ago with a specific set of instructions, with a specific provider, in a specific healthcare facili facility. This subpoena will give you no new relevant evidence. And we, we got that first court order. Well, then the next request was, well, if you aren't going to give us a subpoena, give us all your correspondence with the Department of Justice. Well, same thing. We went back to court. Your Honor, the correspondence now, five years later, has nothing to do with this person's use of this product on this day with the state of the industry and the knowledge of how that device or that medication was best being used at that point in time. It's irrelevant. So we got a second good court order saying, no, we're not going to make them produce it. Well, you know what's coming next. They asked for all the documents you produced to the Department of Justice. Well, we already had two good court orders in hand, and that, ser that request for production was served in three courts by three different sets of plaintiff's attorneys, identical requests at the same time. Well, what do we do? I analyzed the three different courts. Two of them were federal courts that I thought would take a quick informal call about it that I would more than likely get a decent ruling on. But the third court was a state court up in Oregon, and I was really worried about it because all I heard was that this former plaintiff's attorney, who is now a judge, would, would allow whatever the other side wanted. So I was very concerned about that last court. But they had a formal process for hearing motions for protective order. So it was going to be a while. So strategically, we decided, let's organize, we'll serve them all at the same time. We'll serve our motion for protective order at the same time we request the informal conference with the federal courts. Federal courts, we got on the line within the week for both of them, and they both agreed. And the reason why they agreed we didn't have to produce the documents is because we had such a long history of producing documents relevant to this plaintiff's use of this product at that particular point in time with the state of knowledge in the medical industry with the instructions for use at that time. That documents produced to the government in response to a subpoena has a global financial impact, but that particular plaintiff's case does not have to know about all of the financials around the country which is really you know, kind of more the focus of a Department of Justice inquiry. So those two federal courts agreed with us. Yeah, you know, I, I just don't see why they would have to go through the burden of producing and reviewing and involving all of those documents in this case. I even said to the court, I said, here's what's going to happen. They're going to find something that the client produced to the Department of Justice, and they're going to come back screaming to you that they withheld documents. You know that's why they want this. They want the sound bite. I don't think that that's a legitimate claim based on the different scope of the Department of Justice subpoena may have. And the court agreed with me. That he didn't want that issue. He didn't want to have to deal with claims of withholding of documents. So I frankly got there because I knew the way it was going. Well, so then we went to Oregon. And I stood in front of that judge. And he said to me, I would have ordered this discovery except that you've got four orders from four different courts saying, mm -mm, not relevant, not going to go there. So my point is, I know mass torts are tough. I know they're expensive. But if you can look through the, what is it called, the silver lining, having multiple court forms and strategically using them can help control your burden, can help control your cost. <clears throat> So just a quick thought on this, on discovery coordination. 
you know, we serve, many lawyers in my office serve as National Discovery Council. It can also be called National Document Council. There are reasons for that that help you. It helps you reduce costs because one attorney comes in, learns your document structure, where they're kept, learns your, learns your um, people, what, what their roles are, and then that person can take that burden off your desk as in-house counsel and teach your other trial counsel about those things. So that coordination can be a benefit to you in terms of reducing your burden as well as your cost. Also, there's trust. This goes right back to you've got real people using email, using computer hard drives in a personal way. And if I come in and I talk to them and I find out what's on their computer, do you really want another lawyer coming in and asking the same questions for the next matter in the next week, and then yet another lawyer and another lawyer. Talk about disruption to your business, but also talk about, you know, having all those different eyes on your, your sensitive uh, information that your employees have on their computers. So those are the benefits that we can offer as National Discovery or National Document Council. Barry? Uh, thank you, Mary. And from the vendor's perspective, we, we have similar thoughts in mind and similar benefits to um, those, those clients that have mass tort litigation. And that is, as, as vendors, we know, having been experienced as a perhaps a long-term um, coordinator with you of managing your electronically stored information, we know where that data is. We know how to coordinate the collection of that data. We are familiar with the technologies that we need as a vendor to access your data, whether it's through remote technology or on-site. And we become very comfortable with your, your, your um, IT infrastructure and are able to efficiently and quickly and correctly collect, process, and um, manage your data. And with that, we also develop that, that trust factor that Mary was speaking about, and it enables both your national council as well as your, your national vendor to become part of your team that effectively, and again, I'll use the word efficiently, manage your litigation expenses. And, and, and that is an advantage that um, is important as you're going through your, your ESI um, identification and uh, review and production to the other side. And th that is a method of, um, I'm sorry here, of being able to control your, your e-discovery costs. And, and some of the considerations that we would, would gain as whether we're the vendor or there's another vendor that we would gain as as having that experience is we know your custodians, we know what databases are implicated from time to time, from matter over matter. There are complaint databases, there are manufacturing databases, there are document management systems that need to be accessed that may, as Mary mentioned, hold your design history files and things of that sort, your production records, your manufacturing records, your distribution records, your sales records, and so forth. Uh, we also become familiar with your redaction needs in the life sciences arena, whether it's medical device, pharma, or what have you. There are HIPAA considerations, PCI, and PII considerations where there are severe penalties if that information is let out in the wild in an unredacted form. Uh, we also become familiar with MedWatch forms and medical, medical event reporting incidents and so forth. And there's also the consideration that if you're a defendant in a mass tort action, that there'll be plaintiff fact sheets that need to be handled in a manageable way. Sometimes these plaintiff fact sheets become unwieldy. They can be done in an electronic fashion. They can also be imported into a document management system that, again, becomes searchable and um, uh, mineable for information. We also can provide 
custodial questionnaires in an electronic format that will assist um, firms such as, as Mary, Greg, and Mike's when they do the in-person um, interviews of custodians. We can pre-arm them with information in an efficient way. And then, of course, production. We can also do productions, as Mary was discussing, in, in a consistent and repeatable fashion for each set of documents that's being produced and, again, for each jurisdiction where that production needs to be made. And with that, uh, we now have uh, quite a few questions that have come in from our audience. And, and let me start with the first one. And uh, I think, uh, Greg, you might be best suited to answer this one. What's been your experience with obtaining uh, e-discovery from the plaintiffs? Okay. Um, well, obviously the rules of discovery are written to be neutral, although it hasn't necessarily felt that way when you're dealing with a corporation litigating against an individual in a personal injury case. But as social media and text messages and emails become more mainstream, the tides have been shifting and courts are starting to get it. Um, we've been successful here in getting access to plaintiffs' social media, uh, namely Facebook posts. But in order to do so, you, you need to lay the proper foundation. Uh, plaintiff's lawyers are not going to willingly offer this information up or access to the uh, social media without a fight. Um, and, and sometimes uh, plaintiffs will not have their Facebook marked as private. And so in those scenarios, it's okay for a defendant lawyer to go and look at those websites, but the rules are pretty clear that you're not able to befriend the plaintiff or use an agent to friend the plaintiff to get further access. That would It's impermissible communications with the plaintiff. So uh, you do have to be a little bit careful, but in order to get beyond the veil and get full access, you oftentimes need to go before the court. You may require an in-camera review or a neutral um, discovery referee or neutral party to, to be able to screen what is in there because there are some privacy issues. But when you're dealing with personal injury claims, you, you're usually talking about a plaintiff who's claiming that they no longer have the ability to enjoy certain activities or participate in certain activities. And so you may not get unfettered access to that information, but you're certainly entitled to look at um, anything that may be relevant to the issues in the case. And uh, recently I particularly came across a, a wonderful post from a plaintiff's husband who posted pictures of his wife zip lining um, recently, although she has a pending lawsuit against a device manufacturer of spinal equipment where she's claiming that she's unable to work or enjoy basically any aspect of her life. So that was a nice find. Um, so the law is evolving here, and it's going to continue to evolve, and it's not consistent. Um, you're, you're really talking about venue-specific inquiries, um, but there have been some good developments. I recently read about a Nevada court um, that issued an adverse uh, inference instruction as a sanction against a 22-year-old plaintiff who deleted her Facebook post after, after she retained counsel. So the court basically found that even though she was young and naive, once you retain counsel, you have basically the same duty as a corporate uh, defendant to retain and preserve that data. Um, and there's case law out there that says that just because a plaintiff may mark their Facebook status private, that doesn't entitle them to greater expectations of privacy, uh, specifically in civil litigation. So you may not be able to look at it with a Google search, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a court won't issue an order that allows you to, to see what else is out there. And I've come across a handful of cases recently where courts have allowed discovery of social media and post sanctions for the destruction of that information. So it is evolving. It is shifting slightly back to the defendant's favor in that regard, but um, that's been our experience. Uh, you know, getting your hands on text messages can be a bit more complicated because of the, those things don't tend to preserve themselves forever and uh, can often involve um, the wireless carrier. So, uh, Thanks, Greg. Uh, we have a question that was specifically asked of Mary. Uh, what challenges do you see from corporations who aren't experienced in these types of matters? That is, collection issues, sticker shock, burying their heads in the sand, and so forth. 
sticker shock. Probably. I don't think of them as burying their heads in the sand. Actually, my favorite clients are the new ones new to, new to this because they want to do it right, and they have an open book about how to do it. So I like working with those folks. Um, and one of the things that I hope we've emphasized today is we have developed strategies over time, learned from things about how to save costs. But it is expensive. It is expensive. And I guess my, my best advice for new companies coming into this type of finding themselves in the mix of a rush to amass tort litigation is to, to start early and to be deliberate, to strategize, to document what you do so that five, six years down the road, if someone challenges the completeness of your collection, you can pull that out. You say, I spent X number of hours. I had X number of employees working. They spent X number of hours, and here's what they did. Boom, 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 boom. So my advice to the, 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 the new ones on this is congratulations, number one, because you haven't had to deal with this before, but number two, um, do not hesitate to ask me very tough questions about how much I think it will cost. Do not hesitate to ask technology vendors about what they can do to reduce costs. And I work with technology vendors very well. I also have my in-house group. I can do a hybrid approach where we do work with a technology vendor on the outside, and then we also have people on the inside working specifically to control and reduce costs. So it's costly but ask your counsel questions. And do not be afraid to say, what alternatives do I have to reduce cost? Thank you. And we have a, another question here. And I'll leave this open to the, to the group, and whoever would like to answer, please do. We have found it beneficial. Why have you found it beneficial to have a dedicated discovery counsel in your cases? Sure. Th this is Mike. Uh, and I can speak from frequent and uh, recent experience. I think the court looks at, at the attorneys, the plaintiff's attorneys and, and defense attorneys as advocates for the parties. Um, I've I found success bringing somebody like Mary in. Uh, the court starts to look at them as impartial. They're, they're not in the courtroom arguing about deposition dates or should or shouldn't uh, you know, the plaintiff's Facebook profile be, be um, discoverable or, you know, the, the issues that, that bring the litigators in the court, uh, you know, a couple times a, a month or, you know, in your busy case, a couple of times a week. If you bring dedicated discovery counsel into the court, a lot of times the judges really don't have a strong understanding of e-discovery uh, and especially, you know, new or older judges they don't know anything about it. So by bringing somebody in who has a really strong background in e-discovery, they become almost a de facto expert because typically the plaintiffs aren't bringing their dedicated discovery counsel or don't have any. So somebody, uh, you know, I brought Mary in before, and all of a sudden the court's asking her questions. So, you know, what does this mean? You know, if I order this, why is that a problem for you? And she becomes less of an advocate for the party, or at least how the judge views her, and, and more of a, a de facto expert that the court can almost rely on. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, I've, I've been saying something for, for weeks uh, on weeks, and, and the judge is saying, okay, I get what you're saying, and then all of a sudden you bring in discovery counsel who gives the exact same message and it comes across unbiased and the judge says, oh, that, that makes sense and all of a sudden, you know, we get the order we've been asking for for, for uh, months. Uh, so I, I think it, in, in terms of creating credibility in front of the court, um, it's a good thing. And I, I also think in, in terms of for the company to have one person to call, uh, sometimes the discovery counsel becomes a, almost a, a member of the in-house counsel team. Uh, if you have a question about what document, where a document is, or did we produce this in a certain case, instead of calling 20 different law firms in 20 different states and getting 20 different answers, you can call one person, 
they can give you an answer, uh, and then you can turn it around and give that answer to whoever you need it to. It, it, it just streamlines the process for uh, the in-house counsel. You know, Mike, that, thank you so much for that because you had a different insight on it than I did, and I appreciate that. And let me just follow up with this quick note. I was recently brought in on a case to serve as discovery counsel, but discovery had already been well underway. There were two adverse discovery orders against the company, and the plaintiff's attorneys on the other side were making all sorts of noise about default motions. So they called me and said, you know, what can we do? They're now asking us to image inboxes that are in a foreign country in a different language, and if we don't, they're moving for default. Well, I, I said, okay, well, now why would you do that in the first place? And we talked about it, and I found that they had a 60-day retention limit on inboxes. And so I went back to the other side, and I said, look, guys, there's a 60-day retention limit. Do you really want to insist that we go searching for emails that you think were written five, six years ago when the design process was being undertaken on this particular product? And I was able to work our way out of it. And on that case, it grew from that initial you know, resolution of that issue to the ultimate defaults finally did come. But I had dug in and done nothing but push opposing counsel to deal with me on document issues. I didn't get involved in the liability case. I just worked on their document issues that I had seen in their letters that they were talking about in front of the judge without resolution that were painting the company in a bad light. So I slowly got them to agree that they had what they need to try their case. I got that written in a letter. Well, here comes the default motion. I defended three default motions in that case, and we got to the courthouse door, and we were really worried about just getting there. So. As Mike said, well, I guess the reason I wanted to even mention this is because there was a special master in that case, and until I came along, he was really struggling. And when I came along and helped him understand the systems and the people and hard work and all of the stuff that had been done, he started talking to me exactly as Mike just described, which is, well, um, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And he's the guy who wrote the orders denying three of the default motions. So it helped because he, 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 he commented very positively that, that having document counsel really assisted the court, and ultimately I think that helped us get to the courthouse doors. Well, I think we have time for one more question, and the answer will need to be, um, I think, somewhat short. Um, Mary, this is specifically, again, for you. You've told us about a number of your court orders you've obtained on various ESI issues, and maybe that was the one you just relayed is the horror story of horror stories, but perhaps you have a good war or other horror story you'd like to share with us. Um, and, and perhaps what was the most difficult ESI motion you've encountered thus far? Well, since I already told you about the three defaults, I'll just put that one aside. But I think the other one, and I will try to be quick here, um, we were served in a mass tort in four separate courts at the same time a request to keyword search data, 248 keywords, unlimited, just this word, this word, this word, 248. And that was three or four years into litigation. We'd already done our searching. So I could see what they were doing. They were just trying to paint us in a bad light. And it was going to be, we ran the search. We found out it was over 500,000 hits. I went to them and I said, I'm not going to review 500,000 records. I'll review a few. I did that. Here's what it says. There's nothing new. We had a meet and confer, and in the course of the meet and confer, they said, well, fine, then we want your data. We want all of the data, raw data that you collected from this company, which was in excess of 500 gigabytes at that time. And of course, you know, that unreviewed stuff, uh, no redactions, no privilege review, lots of sensitive, competitively sensitive information in that data that had nothing to do with the product at issue. I mean, the, the likelihood that a court's going to order that is low, except that they said, all you have to do is put it on a hard drive and send it over. There's no burden there. You've already collected it. So they thought they had a pretty good argument, and frankly, I was a little concerned about it. So what we did, we filed a motion for protective order in two courts. They filed a motion for, to compel in two courts. So I had four motions pending with different judges at the same time, and these were all over the country. The judge that I was worried about the most, the former plaintiff's attorney, was the first one to hear it. So I showed up at that hearing, 
with a PowerPoint in hand to talk about all the work we'd done. And the first thing he said to me was, well, you know, did you know that I sanctioned one of these, you know, and he named a company, and I won't name it today, a Fortune 500 company, uh, a, not long ago for e-discovery sanctions and, and defaulted them. And I just said, you know, Your Honor, it wasn't me. Let me tell you what we did. And I talked to him, I kid you not, for two and a half hours about first case, what we did, second case, adjustments we made, all of the work that we did over the course of time to comply. At that point, I think we had 1,333 written discovery requests that we had already served responses to, to the same coordinated set of plaintiff's attorneys. You know they all coordinate, but they're repeat offenders. So here we are, they're asking for all of the data we collected, and I can tell you based on my keyword searching of it, that as for this plaintiff using this product on a particular day with a particular set of instructions, particular healthcare provider, with the state of knowledge in the industry, nothing, you know, I can reasonably say that there is little, if any, unique, relevant evidence left. I spent two and a half hours with him. I stopped. I asked him if he followed me. I asked him if he had any questions, if he had any concerns, and we slowly went through basically three and a half years of discovery <clears throat> and to show that there really wasn't much left for these guys to get. At the end of that presentation when I sat down, he looked at the other side and said, counsel, you know that if I deny your motion, I have to sanction you under the rules. He was reading that rule about, you know, not having a reasonable basis, very, very literally. And uh, he said, do you want to withdraw your motion? This is the motion to compel. Do you want to withdraw your motion? And they kind of looked at each other and said, let's confer. And then he looked at me and he said, well, given what I just said, would you agree, Ms. Novacek, to letting them withdraw their motion to compel? So I thought about it and I said, Your Honor, this set of attorneys coordinate with others. This exact same issue is pending right now in four courts. If they can get on the phone and get everyone to withdraw this request, I will agree to allow them to withdraw this motion. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. But in terms of horror stories, that was a tough one because from the minute it was served until the minute we got to the end of that hearing, it was really a concern of mine for what these crazy knuckleheads on the other side were, were going to do. I hope that wasn't too long, Barry. I think we're good. Robin, I think I'm going to turn it back to you. Absolutely. Listen, I want to say on behalf of the team at BIA, we want to thank you all for your valuable time in spending time with us today learning about medical grade e-discovery. And we want to thank our distinguished team of attorneys, uh, Mary Novacek, Mike Hurwitz, and Greg Jackson and the firm of Bowman and Brook. Thanks to all of you on the call, our Knowledge Leadership Series is celebrating two years of presenting monthly programs whose topics have been set by you. Next month, we'll learn to speak geek as Alon Israeli, a licensed attorney, IT professional, and certified information system security professional, teaches us about the vernacular used by IT teams when they're managing e-discovery. Lastly, as you exit today, if you'll just take a second to answer the survey so that we can continue to provide valuable programs to you, we'll be grateful. And once again, thank you to our distinguished speakers today and to you all on the call. Thank you, Robin. Thank you.